I think that, you know, when, when it came out first, um, years ago, you know, when WWE defended it. And I mean, the two things that really have stuck out for me in this kind of latest incarnation of the story with stuff that you've written and, and other people is that, um, number one, the story that the WWE told me and other reporters at the time, um, you know, that there was, you know, they didn't know that there was no meeting and all that stuff is, is clearly been disproven considering, you know, what, uh, Dr. Ferdinand Rio said, what, uh, John Laurinaitis said, um, or his lawyer said and things like that. And then, um, you know, the other affidavit about the different things that were going on, which, you know, again, with, with WWE, especially in that era, um, you know, it's, it's been kind of like, um, what would I say? You know, I mean, the, the, you know, when you're talking about that mid 2000s era, it's, it, there were all those rumors that were going around at the same time. It was one of those things that was always alleged to be happening in Hollywood and everywhere. And kind of like those standards, you know, today it's, you know, again, I'm not defending it even then at all, not, so, not one bit, but it was kind of, um, just kind of boys will be boys back then. And today, you know, it, it's people kind of, uh, look at it very differently as they should. And, um, it's become kind of a, I mean, it's just a lot of stuff to really digest, I guess. Yeah. There's a lot, <clears throat> a lot going on there. And I think one of the really interesting things about the grant lawsuit is that it is leading people to revisit some of the stuff that has been out there with a new eye or new information is coming to light. And that's great because in the really big picture here, we're talking about, you know, abuse of women, abuse of employees, people working under bad conditions. To me, all of that needs to be re-examined, not just to find out what happened and kind of get accountability for it and hear people's stories. But because when you look at institutions where things like this have happened, if that isn't brought to light, what tends to happen is the institution becomes extremely self-protective. It finds scapegoats, it puts them out there, and it doesn't learn the lessons it needs to have abuse not perpetuated in the future. So I do think it's really important to be looking back at, at things like this. And over the last few days, um, I've been talking to people in the business uh, in part about things that were going on back then. And a consistent theme is, is yeah, it was, it was really, it was really wild. And I look back and I wonder how, you know, how that kind of persisted and, you know, finding answers to that does, does feel important. I mean, when we, again, when we look about it, this was, this was, a you know, again, the, the, the nature of the business, um, because I mean, w number one, it was, it was not really sports and not really entertainment. It kind of flew be be below the radar until recent years. And as far as mainstream media coverage, I think that's part of it. So they were kind of Certainly. like this, this insular world where they could pretty much again, again, with Vince, Vince was the king of this world and he could do whatever he wanted. And he had plenty of people to, you know, cover up his mess you know whatever he was going to do he was very confident it could be covered up and it allowed things to persist um and i mean it's kind of fascinating to watch uh, people when they start showing old clips of things that you know again i i just remember certain things we would be in the news with vince and then like a week or two later on raw we would see them sort of revisited in this weird way that was like defending vince um you know from false allegations that were um you know, and it, it, apparently with the benefit of hindsight, a lot of them were true. And I think that, um, you know, but the fact that he would just blatantly do that on his own television show, like as his own TV show at times was his, um, um, what's it called? Like uh, his catharsis, I think, you know, he, he, would, he would script things on the, the TV having to do with his frustrations in life. Absolutely. And I think that's probably one reason some of this stuff hasn't come in for the mainstream scrutiny it might have because if you're if you you know I'm a I'm a long time wrestling fan long time observer reader um certainly doesn't make me an expert or anything like that but I think I do have a bit of an understanding of how blurry that line between reality and fiction is um and and one of the interesting things in the new statement from Ashley Massaro is she's 
explaining how the scripting of your on-screen character can be a tool used against the real life performer. Um, like the the, pre and, the pressure again, the pressure on yeah. you right there on screen to I I would say acquiesce if that's the right word, but to certainly toe the line. Yeah. Yeah, and that's a very that I, that can be a very difficult thing I think for people who don't have some familiarity with wrestling to understand. You might sound like a crazy person saying, "Oh, well, he retaliated against her for rejecting his advances by scripting this or that." And somebody might say, "Well, it's like an actor. What does it matter? How does that affect them?" Uh, you know, that's the job. You do the scripts you're written that are written for you, and to some extent, that's fair and to a large extent that really misses the reality of what goes on in wrestling and a lot of the pressures that are on the performers i mean when you look at the you know there's there's always pressures on all the performers but the pressure the pressures on the women performers now and even far more then um were very different than the male performers the male performers had to be able to do promos they had to be able to um um, you know, wrestle at a certain level back then it was for the women, it was how you looked. And there was this feeling that, you know, look, we've got, you know, all these different people from the diva search every year that we can bring in and they're all really good looking and not that they're interchangeable, but largely we can replace you at the stamp of a finger, even if you're popular, which is ha which happened to people. So it becomes kind of a thing of, you know, don't piss off the vault, the boss. And, um, I saw something, um, you know, where like uh, Francine, you know, was mentioned something, I think, on her podcast. She talked, she talked a lot actually this week on different aspects of like, you know, just, you know, kind of getting the advice that like, oh, if something happens, just, just say that you're you're ill rather than actually turn down and you'll be, you know what I mean? Like, oh, I'm not, I'm not feeling good type of a mm -hmm. thing is a lot smarter, kind of like advice if somebody hits on you. Um, and it's kind of, you know, and it's it's the so the pressure on those women um, you know, was very, very large in a very different way than guys can understand. And this come, you know, I think from today's standpoint, the one thing that everybody is kind of looking at is, okay, we know about Vince and Vince is gone. Okay. But it's like exactly who should be held accountable and how much in the sense of, did people know that this was going on? And it's like, certainly from a rumor standpoint, everybody did, or many, many did. And, from a insider standpoint, there were those who knew more than others, you know, more, they were more part of the inner, inner circle. And who were they? They still were not going to be people who would cross Vince because they were there because they didn't cross Vince. Um, and, but how responsible should they, there be? And there was a culture, which is the key thing. And that you brought up, it's like, there was a culture there and that culture is, is a big part of the problem. Vince, um, was a large part of shaping the culture, but the people around were all part of the culture. How culpable should they be? And that's a really hard question, which I've still been like, trying to wrap my head around. Yeah, it's a terribly difficult question to answer. So everyone I've talked to, and I'm sure you know much more than me, um, has, has, described a system in some level of awareness. Were they aware of the sorts of things in the uh, in the Chanel Grant lawsuit? No. Were yeah. they, um, did they see Vince making out with divas in the locker room the way Ashley Massaro said she did? No, but there was definitely some level of awareness that at the least Vince was you know, having or pursuing inappropriate relationships with people who work for him. The yes. same way in the suit, there is at the least, you know, there is alleged a level of awareness from a number of upper executives that at the least Vince had his girlfriend on the payroll in a fake job. There, there was some yeah. awareness. And you get to this question of what did they know and what should be done about that? And that's so difficult in part because the company was so controlled by Vince McMahon to the point where even after he resigned due to information about the NDAs and sexual coercion being alleged came out in the Wall Street Journal, he was still able to march back in and take over the company as we, as we know. So it's not to excuse anybody, but I think to start answering that question, you have to acknowledge that people 
even with the best of intentions and who may have had some awareness weren't in they weren't necessarily in a position to do anything about it other than go public with allegations that they couldn't necessarily prove and that's a lot to ask of people i think in a general sense you have to put more accountability for that on people who are higher up in the food chain who knew more and who were better in a position to do that if their conscience demanded it. If somebody is, um, if they're a, a kind of rank and file wrestler, it's asking them, it's asking a lot of them to, to step away and denounce this when you're talking about their ability to pay their mortgage, save for retirement, save to put their kids through school. Whereas obviously there are, you know, people who are making a lot more money and had a lot more, uh, the independents who, if they were aware of this and chose not to say anything about it, I think that should be probably looked on a little more harshly. Is that, do you think that's fair? Yeah, it's, it's just such a hard thing because I think a lot of people want answers and there's certain names that come out, obviously, like Paul Levesque and Nick Khan. Like, mm -hmm. what did they know? Should they be there? And what we do know about them is that, you know, they, they voted, they voted not to have him back. And then Paul's his son in law doing that. And then a week later, they completely flipped and you had, and I mean, I think that this, you know, in, it, when it happened, it was a big deal, but even now I think it's much bigger when you look at these board members who all resigned rather than flip. So, right. so that tells you how strongly they must have felt because the board things, you know, it's a, it's a good position to be in, you know, with the stock options and everything like that. Well, Dave, you even had the uh, Bruce Pritchard quote in the observer today where he explained why he can't say anything. And the last line that you had was because he could lose his job. Well, of course. I mean, if, if, if he said the wrong thing, of, of course he would. And, 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 and look, look, I don't think anyone expects anyone in there to say something damning. Um, you know, the only person I would say from like what I would call the inner circle who said anything of substance would be Laurenitis through his lawyer. And that's all, you know, in his case, it's it's largely self-protection because he knows he's in a lot of trouble um, and his reputation's destroyed already. And, you know, so he's just trying to, um, you know, put as much blame on Vince as he can to deflect. And and most people aren't buying it. But in doing so, you know, I mean, he he certainly to me was one of the key people in, in taking this Ashley Mazzaro story. And putting it in a new light because when it first came out it's like her word against the entire company i mean like it wasn't just they released that that statement they had the people on the tour you know everyone on the tour but one you know basically going through and telling people it's not true it's not true it's not true i mean they fought hard on that because it's a really nasty allegation and then it comes out you know and i guess you brought it up and and you know i mean when paul london said things it's one thing but when rios the doctor you know, said, yes, you know, she told me. And when I went to Laurenitis, he said he knew. I mean, that puts it in a complete, that that changes the the the, the credibility quotient a great deal. And I mean, Absolutely. That's, and yeah. that's that's one thing I wanted to, to talk a little bit about um, is just the credibility here, because that was one thing that surprised me when I started looking in, into the story and reviewing what people had said on different different podcasts or the like was how much it all locked together a little bit and this has been a bit of an odd story to cover because usually when you're usually when you're covering a story about sexual misconduct people aren't going to want to talk about it for good reasons maybe they're witnesses in an ongoing investigation maybe they're targets of an ongoing investigation most people have every reason not to say anything but in this case, because these are, pub, you know, these are very public figures and there's a lot of interest in these stories among wrestling fans, people who had direct knowledge of this stuff had, it turned out, been talking about these things for years, in some cases without getting much attention paid to it, because there's a, there's a lot of interviews people give. But the Rios interview, and I don't say this with any disrespect whatsoever to the reporters or the producers of the Ashley the WWE Audible podcast that came out last last summer or last fall. I don't know if they realized exactly the significance of what Rio said or that it contradicted the 
uh, WWE denial of everything. They certainly didn't emphasize it in the episode, but he was plainly saying not only that he was aware of it, but that he had reported it to John Laurinaitis and that John Laurinaitis had told him he was already aware of it. And that yeah. is really important to me because as you say, Laurinaitis and his lawyer have, and I say this without casting any doubt on what they're saying, but they have a motive to make WWE look bad or Vince McMahon to look bad uh, out of self exculpatory motives. The fact that what Rio says lines up with what Laurinaitis says, and then it's further corroborated by things Paul London had said, it all really fits together. And yeah, I'm not comfortable generally saying people lied. Um, Somebody but, did. Uh, yeah, I, I I think it's pretty clear that the best possible construction you could put on WWE's denial is that whoever put out that statement didn't know what actually went on, and I don't buy that. I think it was a cover up, and that is really it's a big it's a cover up of something really big, really really big. Yeah, and something that's crucial. This is crucial to me because we. One of the things that we reported was that that hadn't been previously reported was that the Navy actually did an investigation into Massaro's claims. Yeah. And that we don't know for a fact, we're still waiting for the investigative files to come in, but that started the month after Massaro died. And that would indicate to me that they started looking into it because that affidavit was published after her death. Right. So. We don't know what the result of that is going to be. It could back her story, it could refute her story, or they could say 13 years had passed since this happened. We just we couldn't find out anything one way or the other. I, I don't know. But two things that are significant to me there are that in the in the denial, WWE originally said that if they had been aware of this, they would have reported this to the base commander, which it doesn't seem they did. There was only an investigation opened after her death. So I would have a hard time believing they actually did that, even though they said that's what they would have done. And the other bit about it, I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> so I'll stop there. There's a lot of significant, there's a lot of significant stuff there. Hey guys, did you love this clip? If so, you should join our channel. Just hit the join button and you'll have full access to every single show that we do. Wrestling Observer Live, Wrestling Observer Radio, The Brian and Vinny Show, all of them in full HD, full length, plus archives of all of your favorite shows. Click join today and don't miss out.